the third episode of the Charter School Connection. I'm Sean Wortham. I interviewed Rebecca and Renee from Itinerous Early College High School out in West Jordan, Utah. They had a lot of great inputs about how they developed a partnership with a local uh, college and university out there in Utah and how they developed an environment which is uh, unique from most charter schools. And they're expanding and growing, and so I got a lot of great insights of what they're doing, what they've done, things that they've seen uh, work for them. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to join our Facebook group, The Charter School Connection, and uh, subscribe to our podcast. There's going to be a lot of great content coming out your way. For us to build our charter school community, it's easier if we all do it together. Anyways, hope you enjoy this episode and hope you get into it. All right, Renee and Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me today um, on the Connected Podcast. Um, For those who don't know, Rebecca and Renee are the leadership team over at Itinerous and just thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, Um, I guess starting with you, Renee, would you mind just giving a brief introduction of who you are? Sure. Uh, My name's Renee Edwards. I'm the executive director slash principal of Itinerous Early College High School. Uh, I began with the school in 2007 during our fourth year as a charter school. So I've been with the school for most of the time that we've been a school. Uh, I began as a science teacher and then after getting my administrative license, I became the assistant principal. And when our founder retired, then I stepped into the principalship role. So I am a transplant from California, probably like most people. <laughs> um, and I just fell in love with the notion of school choice. So I myself was experiencing that lack of choice when my um, children were entering school age in California. And The option was your neighborhood school or a private school. Um, And it was quite frustrating because uh, the neighborhood school was not up to par, so to speak, um, serving the needs of our kids. So I enrolled my daughter into private school, which is quite expensive. So when we moved to Utah, the notion of school choice and charter schools was just an amazing, amazing opportunity. So um, I did apply to the district because our school initially was um, under one of the districts here and was put in touch with the founder because um, our educational interests were similar. And I began as a um, scientist and an engineer. I didn't go to school initially to be an educator. And so um, working at a STEM focused early college high school made sense. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it pretty much, this is the only job I ever considered taking in Utah. And um, here I am still. Wow. Okay. Um, man. And so for those who don't know too much about STEM, could you explain what STEM stands for and what STEM is? Oh, sure. Um, STEM, we refer to a lot of times in education. It's the acronym kind of encompasses um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Although it's not necessarily like those core areas, it's really, to me, a way of approaching um, teaching and learning, thinking about um, developing critical thinking skills and problem solving skills and Um, Instead of saying there's no solution, finding an answer to something. So it's really a a way of thinking as well. Yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. And so that's awesome. And so I imagine, what did you get your degrees in? Uh, Well, I started out thinking I was going to go to medical school when I was, you know, young and ambitious. (laughs) (laughs) So my initial degree was in biochemistry. Um, And then uh, when I realized, no, I didn't want to spend a long time in school doing medical school. (laughs) Um, Then I did my master's degree in engineering, specializing in biochemical engineering, um, both of which came from um, the West Coast at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, which is one of the most beautiful places in California. So, Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Okay. And so I got to ask how you got wrapped up into the education world then, because you said you were a science teacher and So how how did that happen? Um, Well, when I got my initial undergraduate degree, I worked as a chemist and um, 
our family relocated to Virginia. My, my husband got a job opportunity there, so we kind of shifted gears. And by then I had finished my master's program and, and started in the engineering field, which um, required a lot of traveling. And he was also in the engineering field. Um, and so him and I would sit down and look at a calendar together and say, who, who's going to be at home with the child, you know, yeah. <laughs> who's not. And I said, this probably just isn't working. So I went to a job fair to, to see what else was out there and met um, an administrator from a district in Virginia. And uh, after we chatted for a few minutes, he convinced me that my role was being a uh, middle school math teacher. Um, the hardest job I ever had. <laughs> Man, that sounds, that sounds hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I started to see kind of some areas that I felt like education was maybe lacking a little. I worked with students that had a different background than I did growing up and realized, you know, I could offer a lot to the education realm that wasn't maybe an engineering field, but maybe approaching things a little bit differently so that students um, kind of felt their ownership and their place in school. So that's what got piqued my interest to continue in education. Wow. Yeah. Middle school math. That sounds tricky. I mean, I still remember songs that we would sing in my middle school to remember like the Pythagorean theorem and all that. Oh, stuff. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a very <laughs> pop goes uh, the weasel. That's that's always <laughs> going to be in our head, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, well, awesome. Thank you so much for that, you know, brief introduction of who you are. That's, that's mm -hmm. crazy. We're definitely going to dive in a little bit more on like how you became like an administrator and everything like that, because that is very interesting to me, especially that jump from teacher to kind of administrator. I'm kind of interesting, mm -hmm. uh, interested to learn more about that. Yeah, sure. And then uh, Rebecca, would you mind kind of explaining a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I also have a very non-traditional leap into education. Um, like Renee and half of the state of Utah, I'm originally from California. Um, but I actually came here with the military. So oh. at 17, um, I joined the United States Air Force and went off. And um, my first, after being on the East Coast and the South, I, I got sent here to Utah to Hill Air Force Base. Oh. And at the time, I was in the medical field. Um, and really, I mean, I got my degree and did all that, but I really didn't love it. So, um, I took a different job, um, and then that sent me a couple different places. But when I found out, um, that I was going to have a second child, I decided it was probably time for me to hang up my combat boots, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, did that six months before nine 11. So I, I don't, I guess my baby may have done me some favors. So, um, I was at the time I was in California, I was stationed at uh, a base there and my husband and I just kind of looked at each other and said, what are we doing now? And so he decided to come to the U and I ended up back here in, in Utah. And um, I had a business degree and had been working, uh, as soon as I got out, I started working in the business field and, and kind of trying to, to do that, thinking that that was going to make a lot of money while my husband went to school. And like Renee, school choice, I, I fast forward a few years and I've got a little kid, I'm looking for school and saw an ad to help open a charter school. And uh, the rest they say is history. So I actually helped open a charter school when he was, my oldest was five and my oldest is now 22. So I've been doing this charter stuff for a long time and have watched the movement grow in Utah. Yeah. Um, that role turned into an administrative position um, as uh, for that charter school that I helped open. And so I actually got into education kind of through the back door. But as I was sitting there doing all this paperwork, um, I saw that the teachers were the ones who were having all the fun and all the glory went to the teachers. And so I got my teaching license um, because I was very jealous of the teachers, <laughs> if I'm honest, and went and taught sixth grade. And that has that is one of my favorite years. I taught, uh, well, sixth grade was my homeroom, but I taught students in fourth through eighth grade and just loved every minute of it. Um, and just over time, it's evolved. I, I 
worked in schools. I worked for the state for a couple of years. That's actually how I got to know Renee and realized that I got into education because I love the kids and I love teaching and I love being in a classroom. What was I doing up at the state? So I said to Renee, hey, I'm going to come work for you. And um, things just fell into place. And so now I've been at iTuners for three years and in an admin slash operation slash classroom teacher because I I'm not going to give that part up again. So I actually still <laughs> maintain a classroom. Um, teaching business. So it's just kind of all come full circle and the element of school choice and being able to not just for families to have a non-traditional, but for employees to have a non-traditional option to be in education is a big reason why I'm part of charters too. You find some amazing talent uh, in non-traditional sure. spaces. Holy cow. Well, I definitely, wow. I'm, I'm just a whirlwind, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm impressed my life. By, by both of you. And, uh, I guess the the first thing that kind of pops into my mind is like both of you are just so ambitious and then well educated and talented and it's crazy but it's, it's not crazy but it's just like obviously like no one gets into education to be a millionaire um the fact that you guys are are taking this route and like it really shows just like your care for kids and education and like more the love of what you're doing and to to go this route, which is so impressive and so like special that you guys are, I just can't believe that there's people like you educating youth and like youth have the opportunity to, to receive education from people like yourselves. This is awesome. But, well, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, awesome. Well, thank you both for your guys' introductions and uh, we'll probably dive a little bit deeper into that. But to start off, I was wondering if you guys could just explain to kind of all of our listeners what Itinerous is and start from the ground up, maybe talk about the founder a little bit, how the idea came about, and then kind of dive into what makes you different. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I can start since I was in the initial and then Rebecca can chime in of these last few years. We're going through some growth right now, so um, yeah. that's exciting. Um, we actually were part of Jordan School District. We were actually started by Jordan School District and someone at the district applied for what's called a um, Bill and Melinda Gates 21st Century Grant to get our school started as a biotechnology school. Um, that dream became a reality when that grant was um, awarded in 2003 and then our school opened in 2004 um, again under under a district as a district charter so I joined the school during its fourth year um, starting at the beginning of its fourth year in 2007 and at that time we were on Salt Lake Community College campus and we only um, had 11th and 12th graders. So students would come to school and be primarily in college classes earning their associate's degree. Back then the state was incentivizing students who earned an associate's degree with, um, with a scholarship, a new century scholarship. And that now has rolled into something else. So, um, so the majority of our students, probably 75 to 80% of our students were earning an associate's degree while they were in high school. We are one of the six early colleges in the state of Utah, although there are early colleges across the nation. Most states have them. They partner with, with a higher ed institution to provide what's called dual enrollment. So mm -hmm. a student could take a college class and earn credit both at the college level as well as earn um, that equivalent credit for that area at high school. Right. Um, we decided to go out on our own. We split from the district. Um, probably about eight years in, I would say. And we became authorized under the state of Utah. And at that time, we decided to add 10th grade so that we could have students a little earlier and prepare them. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, our lease for our original building that we helped build on the college campus um, was up for renewal. And we opted to build our own building, which yeah. we've been in now for, I think this is our seventh year, something, mm -hmm. eighth year, something like that, 20 2015, I think we moved yeah. in. Um, and that's been fantastic. I, I equate that to like moving out of mom and dad's house. You know, we used to live <laughs> in the basement and we didn't have our own money and we <laughs> didn't yeah. have a lot of independence. And now we're on our own and we're 100% independent. We have our own building and we're just, just across the street from the college campus, which is great. 
And exciting enough, we um, decided to add ninth grade next year. So we are expanding yet another year. So this oh. is what we're tackling. I don't know, if Rebecca, if you want to add anything. Yeah, you also asked kind of what makes us unique. And since the early college movement uh, came to Utah, you know, almost two decades ago, it was novel. It was new. Um, and you kind of had to choose a non-district path to be able to do this. And, and like we see with most of the movements where charters will choose to do something innovative and tackle, eventually the districts pick those up because they see that, that that's what's good for students. So early college or a concurrent enrollment class is available at almost every high school in the state of Utah. But what makes itinerous unique and special for our students is that if I choose to send my 10th grader to the district school and they can take a concurrent class, no one's helping guide them on their choice of concurrent. Nobody's helping them to decide if, they're, if that's the right fit for them at that time mm -hmm. um, or encouraging them to go into it. If their parents haven't been to college, they might naturally shy away from that. And so you find that only those kids who come from a family where parents have chosen college will choose the concurrent enrollment or AP classes. Uh, you might have the converse where a student's friends are in there, so they choose it when maybe they don't have the motivation and drive to tackle such difficult coursework as a 15-year-old, and they end up with a college transcript that has an F on it, right? Yeah. Um, and they also piecemeal. They just take whatever sounds cool at that time without really any thought to what those classes are or how those classes might mean for their future. Mm -hmm. So what we do instead is from the minute they come in, we start helping them write that plan that what are your goals post high school? Is that college? Is it a career? Is that university? What does that look like? And of course, we know that's going to change, but at least it gives us a pathway to start them on and have them be focused and focused from day one so that the classes they're taking make sense for them, make sense for their pathway. Uh, then it's very targeted. And every year when they meet with their counselors and our meetings with our counselors are 45 minutes to an hour. It's not like a 15 minute rotate. Okay. Fill out a form. Our counselors sit down with them. They know their kids and they say, okay, you like computers. How much closer are we? Does an associates make sense? Cause it may not in today's environment. Does a certificate of completion make more sense for you? Mm -hmm. Does our internship class and getting you in with a portfolio and career make more sense? So they kind of have somebody. The other thing that I think makes us unique, um, we are 51% diverse uh, as far as non-white students. And we are more diverse than any of the neighborhood schools around us because we aren't bound by a zip code, right? So you can we can bring in kids who ch are choosing this and we get a really nice mix of kids. We're about 27% economically disadvantaged. And the reason why that's really important is if you are in a lower socioeconomic status, odds are your parents have not gone to college. And so your trajectory in the back of your mind might be college isn't for me, or I don't know how to navigate the college system. I don't know the college lingo. I don't know the rules that are associated with higher ed. So in a very, very safe space with high school teachers who care about you as a high school student, we help you learn how to be a college student. So when you leave itinerous and you decide, I want to go into university, I'm going to go ahead and tackle that bachelor's. I don't feel lost. The data is so... Um, heartbreaking for the schools who get these kids to graduate high school and get accepted to college only to have them drop out one semester into college because they haven't prepared the kids for the how college rules are different from K-12 rules. Yeah, there's all kinds of services, but the students don't necessarily know how to go advocate for themselves in us receiving those services. So we're also teaching them how to be college students while the stakes are fairly low. We put up some nice boundaries and guardrails so that they don't end up with a burnt transcript, right? We teach them how to be a good student. That's one of the reasons we're really excited about bringing in ninth grade is because we have an even lower grade to start their transcript off and protect them from them, so to speak, but get them <laughs> on the right path as a ninth grader so that they develop those good habits and can start college work successfully as a 10th grader. So we're pretty excited about that, that targeted approach for, for our younger high school students. Mm -hmm. Wow. So cool. Yeah. Um, I guess from, I have just some follow-on questions on that. So um, what did you guys do to establish yourselves as like an early college high school? What type of things did you have to set in place like administratively to, to, to enable this type of education? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, we are a partner with Salt Lake Community College. Um, the other five early colleges partner with a different higher ed institution. And from the founding moment of our school, that partnership has been in place. Um, we have someone sitting on our school board from the college. And we really, it is a challenge sometimes because we we have to, like, for example, align our calendar and our schedule with the college. We try to make sure that if a student was taking a class on campus, they would get the same experience here at Itinerous. So our classes in college sometimes run for 80 minutes, two days a week, and they may not have a class opposite that. Um, so that kind of can can mess with some scheduling. We yeah. also make sure that we use the same textbook. Um, Rebecca talked about what makes us unique. I would add in addition to that, our staff almost every one of our staff hold a master's degree in their content area, which mm -hmm. means that they're eligible to teach as an adjunct for the college. So most of our staff either have a master's degree, some multiple master's degrees, and we even have two that have a PhD. And so they're able to teach that college content to our students in our space so that we can step in and say, oh man, we probably need to need to help this student a little or have some communication with them or with family to provide that support. Or if we sent them off to a campus, we, we wouldn't have that um, scaffolding in place. So I think it was very intentional from day one. We also um, focus on our culture and our school community. And again, that was intentional from day one. We build um, what's called connect advisory time for all of our students. And it's a place for them to connect with a trusted adult and a mentor who becomes the liaison to the family. And we teach students in that course lessons about how to prepare for college, how to manage your stress, how to you know, take tests, how to take care of yourself mentally and physically, um, those kind of lessons. So I think um, we've tried to stay true to our mission from day one. I feel like we have done that, um, but it was definitely something that we was well-planned from the beginning. Okay. And then two follow-on questions. Um, first one is, with a lot of like the people that I speak with involved in the charter school world, they either try to make partnerships with like, if they're like an elementary school, they try to make partnerships with like pre-K, you know, to flow students from pre-K into their schools. And then there's schools like yourself who make partnerships with colleges. Was that difficult to create that partnership as far as just in every aspect, like paperwork and legalities and I don't know, just creating that that bond and that relationship was that difficult or was that once you got the grant was that fairly smooth or yeah that's a good question um well i came on about year three so i wasn't at the very beginning conversations i know there was questions about setting up labs and space and getting the building built and there was all kinds of logistics because being on a college campus you you really don't have a lot of choice in even the color of your walls or, <laughs> or the size of your windows or, you know, the, the outside of the building, it's all pretty much structured. So it's I'm sure they had some interesting basement. conversations. Yeah. I think the challenge since we began in 2004 has been maintaining a, a partnership and, you know, making sure that as, as the changing of the guard has happened in higher ed or in some of our other partner schools that were, um, maintaining that communication and, and echoing the value of our partnership so that as people move out, the institution isn't left with, wait, who, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> How do you fit in? And so that's, that's always a challenge. I mean, higher ed, they definitely are very different than K-12. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've, we've gone through some um, growth and some learning on on really who kind of holds that power and who who we should be communicating with to keep that partnership strengthened. So that's been something that you always want to keep a pulse on. Yeah. Okay. And then this is kind of maybe a little random question, but from my college experience, I always remember just spending so much money on textbooks. And you said that you have to use the same textbook. Is is that like what what is that like? Are you constantly having to update your your inventory or like I'm just curious yeah. myself like how, how well, Rebecca's over school fees so I'll let her speak to that because we spend an awful lot of money on textbooks <laughs> we do and it's been interesting because as the college has moved away from a more traditional hard bound book mm -hmm. which has some advantages for our partnership we do not pass that cost on to students so that's one of the things that we've tried to stay 
authentic in trying to say if our mission is to help students who would be a non-traditional college student access college, we have to make it affordable for those families as well. So the right. school made a deliberate decision to not pass that textbook cost, even though we legally can. That's one of the, the few things we can pass on is the concurrent enrollment textbook fee. We said we're not going to, and we're also not going to make an uh student choose content they want based upon the cost. So one class might be an $85 cost and another might be a $10 cost. We're just going to level that and charge $15 period. doesn't matter the cost that we absorb. Um, with that though, the college has gone to um, a model where they're doing more open resource and more uh, adaptive textbooks online. And with that, I can't buy this big palette of textbooks and then just check them out to students mm -hmm. every year, right, and get them back. And so as, as that's changed, we've had to pivot in how we handle that. Um, I'm proud that the board has stayed committed to keeping costs low for the students, that we've absorbed that cost. But now the Utah legislature actually stepped up and funded an initiative to pay for uh, the expense associated with families who are experiencing economic hardship for them to be able to have money and resources for us to cover that cost even further, which Wow. A lot of people will in schools will appreciate the reality of unfunded mandates, right? They say you have to do this and do it with the money that you already have. So it was really nice that the legislature put the money to back it um, so that we can provide even a greater level of service for our students who are not poised necessarily to absorb the very large expense. Um, so our book room is actually dwindling um, yeah. less and less for the, the textbook cost. But with that, has created an increased cost for us to not be able to reuse textbooks year after year. Um, you know, in the big racket, what does everybody say? I'll oh, buy the edition two or three before because only the picture has changed, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so you know, we're getting away from some of that, um, but we've been able to make it where uh, last count, we figured if a student goes through the certificate of completion with us, they will have on average saved $16,000 for their family. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Isn't that huge? I mean, the difference that it's making for families is real. Yeah. Holy cow. Okay. Yeah, that's incredible. And that's so cool. Um, no wonder you guys are seeing so much success just because the opportunity you're providing students out in uh, West Jordan is incredible. Um, okay, cool. So kind of backtracking just a little bit. Um, I definitely want to dive into all the cool things you're doing right now and your growth. But before we get there, one thing that you guys touched on that I find um, a lot of people listening to this podcast can benefit from your wisdom is how you got to where you are now. We talk to so many schools that are like, hey, we're thinking about expanding. We're thinking about buying a new building, but like leases. And they always talk about bonds versus private funding. And they're like, we want to, you know, Maybe they've only been around for a couple of years and they're like, we want, you know, eight grades. And I love how you guys were talking about how you kind of just started small. You got a grant. You're kind of li living in your parents' basement. You start only two grades. You're slowly growing. I feel like a lot of people can benefit from that wisdom. Could you guys talk about like your growth and maybe some uh, lessons that you've learned and then dive into maybe some mistakes that you've even like came across? just to help others who are currently trying to grow and maybe be like you and they could get some benefit from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I would say um, we did we did have a unique background in that we were started by the district. And so we didn't have, we weren't establishing our own credit. I think that's one of the things that I look back on that was that, ooh, I didn't consider that. Um, so we, all of us were employees of the district. We had all of our programs. We, uh, the specialists were all district specialists. And we really didn't have a need for credit. So I think we didn't um, <laughs> earn credit. <laughs> Looking back, I would say that was probably the biggest ouch to our growth when we did try to move out. It's like, um, I always talk about our first loan being um, like a 
a first car loan of a young person becoming an adult where we had a pretty high interest and we had yeah. pretty high stakes, pretty high um, bond covenants to meet. And we also had a pretty substantial amount of money that we had to set aside each month in a, in a separate pot in case we defaulted on the loan. And it really did, um, it really did strap us down. Um, I think looking back, one of the positive things we did do is we, for us personally, we hired a consultant when we were looking at building the building here and expanding and um, separating from the district. And so having that person bring some lawyers on that helped us with um, putting us on the bond market, looking at, you know, were we going to have one person backing us versus multiple, looking at those covenants. One thing that they got written in, even though we didn't have a lot of credit established, was that we could refinance within a five-year period. So we did have a pretty tough five years, our first five years having the new building, um, things seemed to be pretty tight. And we had to make some decisions. I always try to make sure that we're taking care of our families and our students. So sometimes that decision was around staffing or other resources. Um, and then when we were able to refinance, thank goodness, it was at a really positive time. And we found a fantastic lender um, that actually looks for charters that are um, seeking students that are maybe ones that typically wouldn't go to college and having some successes with their school. So I'm, I'm happy to say we refinanced and just have a great loan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That covenants went away. It allowed us to put quite a bit of money in the bank. Um, and so I think looking back those growing pains, any school, you probably just need to look at, A, what does your community want? What does your community need? And then B, what's the capacity of the school at that time? What can you possibly do? And then just try and make the decisions thinking 30 or 40 years down the road. Like we know we're going to be gone, but we want to make sure that we set the school up in a way that it can continue to be successful. So, right. Well, and yeah. if I can and chime in um, from a state perspective. So I was up with the authorizer for about three and a half years. And so it's really interesting to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, right, of a, of a full portfolio, yeah. and this is a really common itch that, that schools have, especially if money gets tight, or enrollment starts to drop, or is they want to be all things to everybody in a way to think that they're going to be able to grow, so they start adding on grades, or they start adding on programs, or they, they just start adding, right, well, yeah. adding costs money, right, and money is tight, now, I know you have to spend money to make money, but you also have to know how to run lean and you also have to know when it's wise mm -hmm. to expense versus when it's wise to type back. And what is always the best wisdom though, is stay true to your mission because you're not a district. You're not trying to be all things to everybody. You have an approved mission and vision, and that should be your guiding document for all decisions you make. So itinerous has done a really good job of revisiting their mission regularly and making sure that every decision is against, is that who we are. And, you know, people will say, well, the kids want to have band and orchestra. Okay. But when they're a junior, they can go on to college and take a band class. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, we are not the band and orchestra school. That's just not who we are. And is it worth it for us to invest in that, to bring in three kids? It's, it's mm -hmm. not because that's not who we are. And it's really tempting to step outside of your mission and grow and um, strong boards and strong administrators bring everything back to that mission and um, let the district be all things to everybody. You be who you were created and authorized and, and approved to be. And the families that are supposed to find you will find you. And if you're doing things uh, well and you're doing things the right way, you will find those students. You will. Wow. So yeah. stay, stay your mission. Man, that is so crucial. I, I love this. Stay your mission. Stay true to who you are. It's so, it's so easy to try to just be a people pleaser and just try to like, and then after a few years, you're like, what, what are we anymore? We don't even know who we are and what we stand for. And that's great. So stay true to yourself. Awesome. Cool. So we kind of talked about your growth. Um, before we leave the growth and kind of dive into like the now and all the amazing things you're doing now, would you have any just like, I don't know, interesting story of just like, man, like, I really wish we didn't do that. We really just like 
kicked ourselves when we by doing this like in the growth aspect or is there nothing really that pops out to you um i mean i feel like we've had some learning experiences from our growth but i don't feel like i could honestly look back and have any regrets yeah um, I, I feel like we, like Rebecca said, we've stayed true to who we are and we tried to make sure that we include our teachers and our community and our board member and our parents and students in our decisions. Um, I can't, can you think of any? No, because I think even on things, um, changing buildings and, and I'm, I'm the newbie to the group at three years. Um, so I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn on this, but as I hear the stories of the people who've been here since founding, Every time there's change, you really have to just manage that that change and that natural growth. Mm -hmm. and, and some things are in your control and some things aren't, right? Having to go and get a new building or changing authorizers, some of those things are outside of your control and you just ride the wave. Um, but in hindsight, because the board and administration have done things with distributive leadership, they've done things deliberately, they've done things in accordance with their mission, they've done things with an eye singular to what's the best for students and what's the best for our community, that in the mean, in the immediacy, you feel the pangs of change and growth, but in hindsight, you can see that they weren't rash, they weren't knee jerk, and they were, they were very calculated. And so as a result, the hindsight isn't full of regret and and missteps, it's okay. See, we we grew and we grew deliberately and successfully, and now we can tackle the next. Because adding ninth grade, that's going to have those those immediate pangs and that that challenge of change and growth. But because we're being very calculated and deliberate about those steps, hopefully, yeah. in hindsight, there won't be any. Oh shoot! In the... Yeah. <laughs> what were we thinking? Right. Yeah. So oh, I agree. I agree. I I was here when we decided to add tenth grade, and I was. I was the one in charge of adding 10th grade. And um, I can tell you that the staff at that time were very, very nervous. Um, mm -hmm. They they were um, more pessimistic than optimistic. <laughs> right. And we just tried to, you know, problem solve what we could. And we did do a few things that we had to do a quick change to our first year having 10th graders. Uh, for example, our juniors and seniors have breaks in their schedule because um, they're more like a college student. And so we don't ask a college student to be in classes 40 hours a week. Right. right. Um, and so 10th graders, I had built breaks in their schedule. And then suddenly I had students like playing football in the middle of the hall and not, yeah. not knowing what to do. And I thought, oh man, we need to have an organized study hall rather than a free time. Yeah. So there's definitely things we learn. But I think if you were to ask any one of our staff members, they would say adding 10th grade was the best thing we did. So six, seven years ago, it was the biggest heartache, but I think everyone would agree that um, it was a worthy thing to do. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed by like the, the tightrope that you guys have walked and that all schools have to walk with calculated risk because you want to grow slow and make sure that you're making the right decision. But at some point, you know, all those people were nervous about adding 10th and now it turned out to be a good decision. So at some point you have to take the leap or you have to right. you know, make the change. So that's great that you guys are. And when you talk about it, I love how you are using like words like we and like communication. You're always talking about your board and talking and communicating. That seems to me like a real strength that you guys have is it's not just one person going out on a whim, but it seems like there's a lot of talk about it. So. Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, I think we, we, we treat our staff as professionals. And I think for teachers, sometimes that is unique. Um, they've been in other places, schools, charters, or districts where they weren't treated kind of as that equal voice or a professional or given the autonomy to do what they need to do. Um, you know, we hired them for a reason. And I, give them the rain that they need to make good choices and to do good for kids. And I think they feel that. Um, we also make sure when we are having discussions about change that everyone has a voice, everyone has an ability to provide input or um, to talk about you know, what their worries are. And that doesn't mean that we can possibly please everyone, but at least we can come to a consensus. And then when we do move forward, really do the planning and make sure that we do it right. And that's really what I try and instill when we're doing these kind of bigger changes is um, I don't like to be reactive. I'm more of being proactive. And so what yeah. can we do to front end load this and think about anything that could possibly go wrong and let's mitigate it before we start. 
super cool. Awesome. Um, great. So now diving more into what you guys are doing now, you mentioned the teachers. And so talking about what you're doing in the now in the present, I think we have to kind of start with teachers because that's the foundation of a school. What, because my, my wife was a teacher for four years and then she, that's very typical. I hear she got kind of burnt out and now she doesn't teach. Um, what do you do that fosters like an environment to help teachers, like you said, like feel more like listened to, treated like a professional? What are ways that you help teachers, which is kind of different than maybe like a public school where just like show up, teach the curriculum and. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's so what a good question. Um, well, first of all, um, like I said, we do make sure we treat them as professionals and give them autonomy to make choices. They don't always have to feel like they need to get permission as long as they're teaching their standards and, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing, holding class time, then we really are pretty hands off on, on how that learning gets done. We give them plenty of space for collaboration. Um, we aren't a typical, typical school in that our teachers don't have a classroom that they would necessarily call home that they hang out in when class is not in session. Our building is small, and so we use their class during their prep time, and we give them a space similar to, to higher education. We give them a space that's together so they can collaborate. We also um, have weekly meetings after school every Monday. It's common for other districts to maybe meet once a month with their faculty. Um, and during the, that Monday time, we rotate it through so that um, at least two Mondays out of the month is time for them to get together as colleagues and talk about um, what students are struggling, how can we help, share ideas, you know, support the department, that kind of thing. I think we also have to keep a pulse on compensation. And I know people don't go into education to make money, but people have to make money to, <laughs> to survive and support their family. And, um, you know, when I got to this state, I, I saw a substantial difference in the way teachers were compensated compared to California, where I taught before I moved here. Um, and that, that really surprised me, although overall wages were, were lower in Utah at that time. I appreciate that there's this almost competitiveness that came about a few years ago. It started with the districts of um, we're going to start enhancing that salary and one would raise their salary schedule and another would would raise it a little higher. And so I think one thing that we have made sure we've done is keep a pulse on our surrounding districts and make sure that we're remaining competitive. And that those are some hard, hard changes to have to make because you always want to make sure that you're taking care of your students and your school and your needs. And yeah. you can't you can't ignore that main funding stream of salaries. You have to make sure that you're staying competitive because the last thing you want is for one of your teachers to leave and go to a neighboring school because they can make more money. So yeah. I'm happy to say our turnover rate is very, very low. Very rarely do we have teachers leave our school. And I don't wait until the grumbling happens to put salary increases in place. I make sure that every year, if we have funding, I'm, I'm passing that along to the teachers. I think that's important. So I think just giving them that space of that shared leadership, that shared voice, every teacher is also in charge of something else outside of their teaching content area, whether that's a academic club or an initiative we're doing at the school in order to give them a voice and some, some buy-in and, and some leadership to our school so that they don't feel like it's kind of this us against them feeling. Yeah. But I will add. say, yeah, the, the beauty, and when I first came here, I, I kept saying, oh my gosh, do these teachers know how lucky they have it? Like, I don't, some of them have been here since the beginning of the school, which is rare in and of itself. But because of that, I, I, some of them, I think lose sight of how, how awesome <laughs> it really is to be here. So yeah. one of the things that is Renee never asks us to do more for less ever. That, that just doesn't exist. If we do something above our, our agreement, uh, we're compensated for it. Um, prep time is built into their schedule. So for teaching hour, the appropriate amount of prep time is provided. It's not a prep after school, grade after school, use your weekends. Like their time is their time and their work time is their work time. Um, they're, they're given the resources necessary. So I, I do all the bills and sometimes I'm like, stop saying yes, Renee, right? Because if they come down for a teaching need, it's yes, absolutely, right? Um, 
And, but that's so empowering for a teacher to know they're going to have the supplies and the resources they need to do their job with no pushback. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is a lot of times, one of the big rumbles that teachers have is they go into professional development and it's all one. It's all just, no matter what my level is as a teacher, I get the same professional development as a first year teacher. Well, my needs at year 15 don't match year one, right? Yeah. So we've invested really in very research-backed professional development and it's personalized. So teachers set their own goals. Um, in fact, the state is finally catching up to what itinerous has been doing. Um, we set our own goals and then we have money, $1,200 a year actually of money staked against what we want to do for our own goal and growth in professional mm-hmm. development. If I choose not to do it, at the end of the day, I'm the one who's suffering. And when the evaluation comes, that's going to be obvious. But we also don't do the dog and pony evaluation just to check a box, right? The evaluations make sense to where you are on the career service plan. If you're newer, you have a mentor, you have a coach, you have this strong support network while you learn to be a teacher. And it's separate. Renee, everybody knows if Renee comes in your classroom, she's evaluating, right? So I'm fortunate enough that I get to coach and Renee gets to evaluate And the teachers can feel that separation. And they also know that we're willing to invest in them and their development. So if we've invested in hiring you, we're going to invest in making you a great teacher in a very personalized, targeted way. So when he talks about those Mondays, those Mondays, the only time it's professional development is it's when it's around an entire school-wide goal, Mm -hmm. not around an individual teacher's development or or skill sets. Those are separate and personalized. Um, And so time is set aside for PLCs and and meeting the needs of students. And so no teacher feels like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this 20 years and I got to go in and learn the, sit through this horrible meeting for an hour and a half being told something I already know. Like that doesn't exist, but I could probably spend the whole hour going through why we have no turnover, right? Like Anytime we have a teacher leave, it's a very specific to that teacher's and and it's rare individual life that there's nothing we could have done to overcome that. And so when I look at some of our peers who they are constantly having to hire and people will say, oh, the teacher shortage. And I'm like, what teacher shortage? (laughs) uh, People are knocking to come. You know, like yeah, I, I went yeah. to Renee and said, Hey, you want to hire me? Right. I mean, yeah. that's the good reputation that, that I turn has. The last two teachers we lost of, because they were going to get free childcare at the district school mm. they went to. And I tried to convince Rebecca, we should open a <laughs> childcare facility, but she drew the line there. <laughs> like, so, no. No, and I, I think that's important. I do want to make sure I don't ever want teachers to feel like a, they have to use their own money to teach or B that their, their content has to suffer because they don't have Man. funding. So I tell the staff, if there's something you need, absolutely, I will get it for you. I will find a way to get it for you. If it's something you want, then I'll find a grant and you can apply for yeah, it. And apply nine times out of 10, they get the grant and all is well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and I guess my follow-on question, seems like you have no issues with uh, teacher retention. You kind of talked about the things you do to, to help that. Um, what is your hiring process like? Because we all know that not all teachers are the same. It seems like teachers at itinerous are just like tier one. Um, what does that look like to be hired at itinerous? What does it take? And what are you looking for in a teacher? Yeah, I do feel like we're a little bit spoiled because um, we are um, a successful school. We don't have a lot of discipline problems. People kind of know who we are. And so oftentimes when they're applying, we do get, we do get a pretty good, you know, cream of the crop of applicants. And um, this next year, we're going to hire, you know, three teachers, a couple of them, one's retiring, and then a couple new positions that are opening up. Um, So it's unique that we're going to have that much hiring. Um, For me personally, when we do recruiting and when we do interviewing, first of all, I make sure that we're interviewing um, as a group. So for example, if it's a language arts position, then I ask the language arts department to bring a representative, send somebody to represent their department. I have a counselor sit in the interview process and then an administrator sit in the interview process. Um, Secondly, I don't question if if an adult went to higher ed and earned a degree in a content area, I have no business questioning whether they know their content. That's, That's not my job. My job though is to know do they have relationships with people? Do they have an interest in working with students? And how, how do they work with students who struggle um, 
you know, or who may need some, some more support. So our, our interview questions are actually trying to tease out more of that personality to see if they're a good fit for the school. Cool. Man. Yeah. Characters. I don't want to add anything. No, that's it. Yeah. We're not, I, I think some people would think, oh, do I have to send in samples of my teaching? And, you know, like, do we have this big, long, it, it's really not a big, long, difficult process to come teach at itinerous. It's, do you, do you want to see students succeed? Yeah. You know, because then teachers will find a way to have their students succeed without lowering the bar. I guess that's the other thing too, is we set really high expectations and then help our students get up there. We do not dummy down any of our classes. So um, if you love students and you're willing to raise the bar and help students get there, then you'll be a good fit. And that's what we want to know. Great. Awesome. So, and then, so that's kind of your teachers. And now I want to focus on your students. What is like, what does an itinerous student look like? Boy, all walks of life. I yeah. think um, we have a little, we have a presentation that we do for parents that want to learn about our school during recruiting time. And I think there is a misconception really since our, even our first days that we tend to attract and recruit students that are already college ready. And I would argue that's absolutely not the case. Um, half of our students that came in as 10th graders this year um, were under grade level for reading or just about grade level for reading. and and um, only about 30% were testing grade level or, or above for math. So by the time we get them through our program, they're doing very well. Um, we say any student is welcome. We're a publicly funded charter school. It helps mm -hmm. if they're motivated. Um, I think students who feel like maybe they don't fit in in a larger school setting or a setting that has assemblies and you know a homeroom where you can just kind of check in like we get students who maybe were a little bit bored in school and they want the challenge or they like the notion of getting ahead and taking more accelerated classes nowadays i think it's even more students who would like a small safe space where yeah. the adults are trusted um, they have their back and they're supported they aren't kind of falling through the cracks awesome great great um and how, how do you build uh, like that relationship with like parents? Cause I know that's a very hard thing to do, especially cause you're only with the, with the student like a certain amount of time during the day, but they're coming with so much from their home and their parents. What, what's that like for you? Because I know in college, there's zero interaction between Mm. teacher and parent it's just you know professor student yeah. what does that look like in a high school do you have a lot of communication with the parents or is it more like college or um I feel like we have a lot of communication with the parents I think parents by the time they're a parent of a 10th grader especially 11th or 12th grader they're seemingly a little more hands-off in that you may not see them physically in the building Mm -hmm. um, certainly we use a student information system just like any any other public school so we send out grade reports and attendance reports I think what makes us unique is we have that connect advisory period that I spoke about right. so a teacher will have maybe around 20 students that they're basically in charge of and they are the liaison to the family so if a student's struggling in math a connect teacher may be the one reaching out to the family saying hey what can we do to help your student is there any resources we can provide is there anything going on we should know about um, we also have we invite them to student led conferences two times a year and we have like a 95% attendance rate to that it's okay. actually counted as a grade in their connect advisory time but when the when the family comes into the school they're meeting with the connect teacher not with their academic teachers and so that's further reinforcing um, that connection with home um, mm -hmm. what am I forgetting well I think I think something that is unique is we bridge the gap between the hands-off college environment and the do I still need to be helicoptering <laughs> traditional high right like especially yeah. for oldest children right parents don't quite know when that when mm -hmm. that appropriate time to let go is and I think we bridge that really nicely in the fact that parents have high trust for us. They mm -hmm. have high trust for what we're doing with their students. They've had a chance to come into the building, meet administrators, get a fill, and they're choosing the school. And I think that choice of a school that's high trust 
um, helps them let go a little bit. So parents mm -hmm. kind of learn um, in a safe space how to let their children take that next leap into adulthood safely, mm -hmm. because it's not, you have an 18th birthday and all of a sudden you learn to be an adult. There has to be that transition. Um, and parents also have to learn how to let their adult children transition. And so I think we help parents kind of do that as well, um, because we try to help the parents learn how to teach their children to advocate for themselves. So mm -hmm. if there's an issue, how can we teach your child to solve that problem, not you as mom and dad come in and solve the problem. Because we we don't want a parent advocating for a 25-year-old at work, right? <laughs> we we want the 25-year-old to advocate, but that's a learned skill. So if we can help both parent and student do that, and I think we do that well in a really high trust, safe and connected way. Because in that connect meeting, that conversation might come up with, I'm having problems in this content area. And as a group, they might work through a solution for that child to know how to advocate in that content area on their own um, and develop skills that are necessary for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. I feel like you guys are, are trailblazing, but it's something that all schools should, should do. I, I know so many people, so many friends that just fell flat on their face in college because like you said, they were just having mommy and daddy take care of all their issues and, and push yeah. for their success. And then when there's no one there to push for them, they, they don't know what to do. So, yeah. so cool that you provide a safe place to allow students to kind of, I don't know, train for the real world, but the parents are still very involved through certain uh, sources. So that's great. Definitely. We treat them like young adults. We have an open campus. They come and go as they please. There's natural consequences in place if they aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Although they are young people and some mature mm -hmm. quicker than others. So we do have a group of students that sometimes we have to help them make better choices and, you know, firm up that connection. But I think we give them the leeway to, um, to show us what they can do. And then we step in and provide the support where it's yeah. appropriate. That's awesome. Great. Well, um, we're getting towards the end. And I was just wondering if you could talk about the future growth that we've been talking about near the beginning of the podcast with ninth grade and then I after that um, I just have some like questions and it's it's kind of like a, maybe like think of it as like a rapid fire just kind of like if you could keep answers you know less than you know 30 seconds that would be great um, but feel free to just dive into the growth that you're doing for now. Mm -hmm. Um, super excited. So we're going to, um, like we talked about very deliberate growth. So we're actually only going to take half a class of ninth graders in this first year. So it's going to be about 80, 85 students. Um, so we anticipate that we will probably have a lot more interest in that, but, um, those ninth graders, that's, um, interesting because a lot of the schools, uh, around immediately around us are seven through nine. And so we'll be starting nights, pulling them out of junior high. Um, so we'll start making that pretty public here coming up. And then um, parents would be invited to come to tour the building, come and see what we're all about, see if their ninth graders ready for this kind of environment. We still will take um, 10th and, and 11th in the normal way um, in subsequent years. That's why we're trying to keep that ninth grade a little bit small so that we're bringing in both ninth and 10th graders um, over the years. Um, they'll be on a traditional high school type um, coursework. So it'll look very much like if they were going to take ninth grade at their district school um, with 10th grade being that initial college year for them. Because again, we want to put some guardrails up for them. Mm -hmm. If they if they come to a parent meeting and they feel like, oh, I tennis is the right fit, then we would encourage them to be in our first lottery, which is going to be uh, January. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying 2023, but yeah, oh, January of 23. <laughs> um, and then we do something really fun with our new students. So in the spring, we bring them in for a spring social. So they get to know other students because they're coming from, what do we say, 43 different schools. So we want to kind of do speed dating for them and let them get to know some friends in the spring and, and a couple more activities in the summer before they have to come back. So we try to include them as part of the itinerous family right from the get-go, but if they'll start to listen for announcements in the fall, fall and early winter mm -hmm. for those open house nights. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you find it like, is it just me, but I feel like there's like this, I don't know, this uh, false belief that like a traditional school in high school, like 
is the way to go. I every time I talk to people, they're always like, "Yeah, like um, we did a private school or a charter school, but then we want them to go to like a normal high school." And mm -hmm. I've like I don't know why. And then you ask them like, "Okay, well, why is that?" And they're like, "Well, I guess social or whatever." And it's like, so you don't think they can? Yeah. And so like, what do you do? You feel like that's a thing as well because it's just. Um, and how do you guys combat that? How do you guys like take this falsehood that's just kind of floating around in parents' mind? And like, how do you like, I don't know, oh. convince people that <laughs> to to go to? Well, Rebecca probably feels the same way as me that when you didn't have school choice and then you did, you see the value of yeah. it. Um, I personally don't think one is better than the other or more normal than the other. I feel like I've had two two children. Um, grow up in the Utah school system. And they have both attended charter schools and they've both attended district schools. Um, and I think depending on their age, their needs, the family needs, um, you know, all of that weighs in. So I think it's great that um, our school may not be for every student, but there is a school out there for every student. And for some, absolutely a district school is probably the way they want to go. If they want to be, you know, the star football player and the, and you know, go to practice and be in weight training and do that kind of thing. That's probably going to be better served for them at the district. Doesn't mean they can't come here and not play ball. It just yeah. depends on the family's needs. And oftentimes, if we can get families in the door and share who we are and what we're about, those walls come down. It's really yeah. just getting the word out there that there are other options, because I think a lot of times families aren't even aware you don't necessarily pay attention until it's relevant to you and your students mm -hmm. a high schooler now and you're going, wait, I have a choice of where they go to high school. I thought they just had to go to yeah, their went boundary to high, high school. school. So yeah. I think it's getting a word out there that's probably more challenging than than the notion of parents being having this misconception. That's my personal thought. I don't know if you agree, but I just think being honest about what we are and who yeah. we are. Right. That's that's all we can do, you know. So man, so cool. So cool that you guys are just so. Uh, straightforward with who you are and just unapologetic and proud of what you're doing and awesome so um cool that that's that's awesome so are you guys ready for some questions sure this is like speed round yeah. family food okay yeah $10, so, answer. $10, yeah. <laughs> wait when are yeah. we gonna be win <laughs> so yeah this is this is mainly just because I call it the speed round just because a lot of these are kind of random and they don't really have anything to do with each other. So it's just kind of like, okay, give me your best 30 seconds on this, your best 30 seconds on that. Cause there's so much with a charter school, but um, yeah, okay. And I don't know how you guys are gonna divvy this up on who answers, but um, let's see. So, and let's frame this towards like, this is uh, talking to other leadership of other charter schools and your advice to them. Um, how do you make it through hard times as a school? And this is kind of a general question, but how do you make it through hard times? Oh my, well, we just came off of a pretty hard time. So mm -hmm. I think that, um, you have to be, um, there and present and a good role model. Um, I think you have to listen and, and maybe it's not even being spoken, but be, um, paying attention to the stress and what your staff is going through and what your community is feeling and what the needs are. And maybe even have to anticipate that, but at mm -hmm. all times you have to walk the walk. The change is yeah. hard. It's also relevant and it's also expected. Um, but if you, if you look like you're stressed, then that's going to come out. If you look like you're having a hard time, then that's going to come out. And that's probably for me, one of the toughest things about administrators and even a teacher, you can't really afford to have a bad day. Man. Okay. So be present and just be a role model and walk the walk. Like you said, that's how you get through hard times. I, I love that. Um, if you could just give one tip to someone who is either leading or starting a charter school, oh, what would be the question. one tip? Run. Run. <laughs> <That> way. <laughs> run, run far, far away. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did that. And I would say, um, repeating know why you exist mm. be able and, and when we saw, talk about an elevator pitch it's like a two three-story building not the Sears Tower right so know your elevator pitch but know who you are so well that you can give a 10 second elevator pitch and everybody else knows who you are too and then that that is your beacon 
man, that is, that is who you are. So cool. Awesome. I love that. Um, is there anything that you would like to see happen within your local state or federal government that is hindering your education or your school? Funding streams. Yeah. Simplify funding. the funding. I was going to say, is this funding. a wish list? Oh. Uh, yeah, I just told a staff member the other day, it would be so nice if we were given a pot of money and, and said, we we trust you and, and know that you're a professional and you can spend this money any way you want. And I'll even fill out a report of how I spent <laughs> it and show it worked, but not be told what I had to spend the money on. That would be my wish list. Yeah. <laughs> Simplify the funding stream. Make Simplify. that happen. Man, yeah. okay, simplify the funding. Man, that's that's terrible that you guys have to to focus on on that instead of just doing what I, you I want. will say state funding is easier than federal, but they're both a monster. They're both a monster. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um besides ninth grade, what projects and or goals are you currently focused on? You want me to take that one? Yeah. Uh, let's see, we are looking at, um, Utah's moving to this portrait of a graduate. So we're looking at developing our own itinerous portrait of a graduate. What would um, an effective and successful itinerous student look like when they reached adulthood? We are also um, we're in an initiative to build um, internships so that students have access to exploring careers before they transfer into the university and continue their study. Um, we're finding that our students are getting their general education done and, and some elective classes and they're entering uh, junior standing to universities and, and they really don't have an idea, a solid idea of do I really want to go into this field and so I think it's important for them to get into their profession and put some time in and make sure that that's something they're interested in so that they don't have to switch gears later on. So we are in a partnership with some other charter schools to build um, an internship um, kind of like platforms so that local businesses can say, hey, I need an internship and we can do like a matching with them. So we're in year two of that pilot and we're excited about that growth. Oh, Am I missing wow. No, I think those are a big initiative. Yeah. Which is enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that's great. That'll be the, <laughs> that'll that'll be like the a big project. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I guess if you had like one, if you had a uh, like a genie in a lamp and you had one last wish, and it had to be about your charter school, what would you like wish? What would be your one wish to like help your charter school? What does your school uh, need or could use right now? You can take that one. Um, this is gonna sound like all like, I don't know, wishy-washy, but I, I wish students, well, I would like to undo the damage of COVID, but mm. I wish I wish students didn't feel defeated just as a general, like, like there's a sense of a weight on them and a, a heaviness to them that no 15 year old should feel right. Um, I, I want them to feel hopeful and, and excited and see the possibilities of their future and then be willing to, this is that genie part, be willing to do the work associated yeah. with that hope and optimism and yeah. and yeah. all of the the things that they have that are going going good for them and that's what i would wish for yeah, yeah that, that's so awesome just wish that they could just shed the weight and just come and learn and be yeah. optimistic and and yeah wow um okay and then um i guess that's a question that both of you could answer so this isn't regarding itinerous, but if you had a personal billboard, what would it say? Hire for scuba diver. <laughs> <laughs> Have ocean, we'll dive. <laughs> Man, you, you scuba dive? Oh yeah, I love diving. Oh, so cool. Unicorn, so cool. not unicorns, seahorses. Sea I know horses. my animals. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't teach zoology clearly. Um. <laughs> This is what I tell you all the time. I'll be okay. I just have to be dramatic first. There you go. <laughs> I'll be okay. Just gotta be dramatic. Okay. I just have to be dramatic first. There Give me go. a minute. <laughs> so cool. Um, all right, then um, two more questions. Um, do either of you have anything in particular that kind of shaped either itinerous or like who you are as a professional? Like, do you have like a book 
or an author or a movie, anything where you're just like, yeah, this kind of shaped me. And this, hmm. uh, like, is one thing that kind of was an outer influence on me uh, that you could recommend to maybe another charter school administrator. Like, hey, I would highly recommend this book or I would recommend this TED Talk or I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough one. I don't, personally, for me, I just feel like it's my experiences and growing up, my experiences weren't always positive. So I've always tried to find a way to, if you're not happy with something in your life, like change it, don't sit and be happy, <laughs> it's, yeah. figure, figure it out. Like don't sit and be unhappy. I mean, um, you yeah. know, figure out what's going on. If you don't, if you aren't happy about your job or you aren't happy about something going on in your life, like make that change. That's really what's driven me to where I am today, but I don't necessarily think I have like a, yeah, a book to pass along. Yeah, <laughs> no, but that's there's, cool. There's you're, too you're in many, control. right? Yeah. Too many TED Talks, too many podcasts, too many books, but I guess that's, um, don't stop learning, right? Because it's when you decide that you know everything or that you're done, boy, what a disservice you're doing to yourself and your community. So looking for that next TED Talk, looking for that next podcast, taking people's books advice and then seeing what you can glean and apply uh, that's, that's the power that comes in that we are constantly trying to learn yeah. and better our spaces. Awesome. Really cool. Um, yeah. So finally, I'm just going to like leave like just an open-ended question if there's, or space, if there's anything that you want to speak about that you feel like I didn't cover with itinerous, or if there's like any advice that you wish you had, um, I, I'll just kind of leave the floor open if there's anything that you want to say to put a bow on the podcast. Hmm. Do you have anything? If, and if not, that's totally fine. I think you guys have hit a home run today personally. So, but I, I just wanted to provide this space in case there was anything that I didn't cover that you wish we would have talked about. I can't think of anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just, I hope that the people that are, you know, in education and that they are able to find their, find their why again, find their spark again, um, that they'll, I, I think we have one of the best professions, you know, ever created. Um, and I, not everybody's meant for it, but the people who are, I hope that they that they can find their, their spark and their joy and their love again. And if it's not in the space they're in, then don't give up on the profession, find a different space that maybe they can find how they can find their love again, because happy teachers make happy students. And, and the, I think we should all be invested in happy students. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Our initiative this year has been on self-care for staff because you can't take care of your students if you're not taking care of yourself. So it's been a rough couple of years, I think just recognizing that um, the work is hard, but it also pays off. Wow. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah. I've seen that with, with my wife as well. So kind of like when you're in an airplane, it's like put on your own mask before helping others type of thing. And some teachers are just so into helping their students. They just drive themselves crazy and like they don't eat or sleep or take care of themselves like they should. And then they just burn out and wow. Super cool. And know your why. It's like uh, you said, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's all I had. So thank you so much for, for joining uh, on this podcast. And I can't wait to publish it for everyone to listen. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. See ya. Okay. You guys have a good rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.